Hello, Uberers from around the world. My name is Ali, and I am 11 years old, and I live in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to our Ubu Zoom session, where my, me and my classmate Rachel from the Roslyn Elementary School in Montreal will be interviewing our guest change maker, Dan Sweeney. Dan works at MIT in Boston, Massachusetts, where he is a lead researcher for the D-Lab Biomass Fuel and Cookstone Group. He conducts research in the lab and in the field around the world on biomass and waste conversion processes. Dan's work brings to several sustainable development goals, especially to goal seven, affordable and clean energy, and 13, climate action. I will first ask Dan to introduce himself and to tell us more about his work. And then Rachel and I will ask him questions about his background, his journey, his work, his skills, and his impact. Sounds good. Thanks, Ali. And hi, Rachel. Um, yeah, I'm Dan Sweeney. I'm a researcher at MIT in Boston, uh, Massachusetts in the US. And like Ali said, most of the work that I do at MIT is related to cooking. I'm actually not a very good cook myself, uh, but I really enjoy working on challenging engineering problems related to cooking and especially in places where they don't have access to electricity or natural gas, some of the things that we cook with commonly. Um, so I've worked with a lot of people in Africa, in Asia, and other parts of the world on designing improved cook stoves and also the fuels that you burn in those, which is a really important piece. So thanks for having me. Thank you. So Dan, how did you yeah. learn about the issues of biomass fuels in Uganda? Right, so I've been working in Uganda for about eight years now. And initially, that's a good question. Um, I knew a little bit about cooking and the challenges around clean cooking um, from when I was studying in my PhD. And during my PhD, I was, I was learning about mechanical engineering and especially how to use different waste materials to make energy for different uh, uses. And one of the problems that we looked at uh, was actually not in Uganda, but in Nepal, in, um, in the mountain region of the Himalayas. And we were working on a, a cook stove project for a remote village in Nepal. And I was just a student, so I was sort of uh, learning a lot about that challenge and speaking with a lot of people about it and doing some different prototyping and building um, simple technologies to try to address that. And I guess specifically, I learned more about the challenges in Uganda um, a little bit later on after that. When I joined the team at D-Lab, we were actually working with um, some small businesses in Uganda that were uh, addressing clean cooking challenges. So why did you get interested in helping Uganda and finding them clean cooking solutions? I think I became interested in that. I mean, I'm, I'm generally interested in challenging design and engineering problems that will improve people's lives, especially people who are um, maybe less advantaged or fortunate. And um, so this is a, a common challenge in many developing countries. And uh, in particular in Uganda, I think it's about 80 or 90% of the population still uses very simple kind of like open fires to prepare their meals. So there's a big need there and a lot of people working on it, but we still have a lot of work to do. So. so what was the process for thinking of these solutions? How did you come up with them? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think the, usually when we approach some of these problems, the first step we take is um, one, just kind of framing the problem itself, right? So if you say, you know, I want to make cooking better for everyone in the world. That's such a big problem or energy, clean energy access, sustainable energy uh, for everyone in the world. 
that's that's too big for any one person to work on. So we started out by kind of scoping it and narrowing it and focusing on something that even our small team here at MIT could uh, work on together. So I think that that was an important first step. And a big part of that is connecting with people in those communities um, where that challenge is being faced and learning more about the challenge. So we say framing the problem and gathering information. Those are the two really important first steps. You must have spent a lot of time in Uganda working on this project. Yeah, Uganda is it's one of my favorite places to go. It's almost like a, a second home a little bit. I have a lot of friends there. It almost feels like family. And the an interesting thing about the culture in Uganda is people are very welcoming and warm. They really enjoy when people come and visit their home and you know stay in their communities and uh yeah, if you ever have a chance to visit Uganda, I think you would really enjoy it. Um, it's a great place. So how did your family react to this project and you're going to Uganda to pursue it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think my family, they've, they've never visited Africa. They haven't really actually traveled that much outside of North America. And so I think the only thing that they knew about maybe Uganda or African countries in general was things that they had seen on the television or in movies. And I think, unfortunately, you don't often see a lot of good news from those countries. You know, there's some conflict or people, you know, living in extreme poverty. So a lot of the images you see are not very nice. And I think it, it actually doesn't represent those countries very well because there's a lot of very nice wonderful things about those places. The, both the, the people are very welcoming and warm and friendly, friendly. And also there's really a beautiful settings there as well, natural places that are very beautiful. So my family was concerned, um, but they didn't really have a choice. I had to tell my mom, you know, this is part of my job now and my work. So I have to do this. And, um, she was a little bit concerned. I, I had to, I called her every night actually to check in and tell her, you know, mom, I'm okay. I'm eating enough food. I'm safe. So. No, well, I think I'll pass the questions off to Allie. Okay. I have a, uh, I have a question. What yeah. is your process for making your alternate way of like making charcoal? Like what's Ooh, the process? That's a good question. Yeah. So maybe I'll, can I tell you a little bit about charcoal in general in Uganda? Sure. Okay. So we'll start with that. A lot of people in Uganda actually cook with charcoal and maybe some of us aren't that familiar with it, but I, sometimes we use it in our barbecues, right? The kind of black, um, it almost looks like wood or coal, but it's actually, it's made from wood, but you fire the wood and instead of burning it all the way down to ash, you're left with um, the charcoal in the end. And charcoal is, it's interesting because it, people like it a little bit better than just regular firewood, which is what a lot of people would cook with um, in the beginning. And as they get a little bit of income, maybe they'll buy some charcoal or make, even make their own charcoal. And it's nice because when you light charcoal on fire, it continues burning for a long time and it produces a lot of heat. Whereas when you cook with firewood, you kind of have to feed the wood in, right? I don't know if you've ever been at a campfire, but you have to continue adding sticks and logs and things, right? So with the charcoal, you light it, you put your pot of rice or beans or whatever you're cooking, put that on top, and then you can go and take care of other things. So if you know your mom is at home cooking with charcoal, it's more convenient for her. Now the the challenge, this is what we worked on. The challenge is that you need a lot of wood to make a little bit of charcoal. So we need about um, almost 10 kilograms or 10 pounds of wood to make one kilogram or one pound of charcoal. So that ratio of 10 to one is really important. And that means we need to cut down a lot of trees just to make charcoal. Um, so 
in Uganda, you see a lot of people actually cutting trees, uh, especially during the dry season when you know things aren't too wet and rainy. They'll cut trees down and they'll make charcoal and then sell that in the markets. And it's a good way to make money, actually, because there's so many people who want to use that and they'll pay for it. But there's fewer and fewer trees remaining to make charcoal from. Um, and maybe you've seen pictures of different parts of the world where you've heard about deforestation and the forests are disappearing because you know, there's a demand for that wood. So we decided in one of our projects to try to figure out if we could use something other than wood to make charcoal. Um, and so we did some experimenting. We talked to some people who were making charcoal, who were also trying out other methods. And we determined that you can actually take some common wastes to make charcoal. So one example is you can actually take corn. You know, when you eat corn, sometimes in the summer we eat corn, uh, you're left with the cob, right? So you eat all the kernels, it's really tasty. And the cob, we usually throw it in the garbage, in the trash, or maybe if you have some chickens, you can give it to your chickens. But um, you can think of big farms where they grow a lot of corn or maize. In some places they call it maize. And all of those cobs go to waste. And so we actually learned that you can take the cobs, the waste, and turn that into charcoal. And it almost acts the same as wood charcoal um, when you use it for cooking or heating. And so that was a big opportunity because there's a lot of farms producing corn or peanuts or coconuts is another one, many different types of waste. And you can take those and use those to make charcoal rather than just uh, letting them go to waste unused. Sorry, that was a long answer, but does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what got you into engineering? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think I didn't actually know what engineering was. Um, so my, none of my family, all of my family members, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, we do actually don't really have any engineers in our family. So I didn't really know much about it. But I knew when I was a kid, I was really interested in um, like taking different things and taking them apart and trying to put them back together. Um, so I think one time I took apart a radio and then I tried to put it back together and see if it would work again. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but it was really fun to open it up and see all these different pieces in there. I didn't, you know, didn't, when you look at the radio from the outside, you don't know how it's, what's actually producing the sound and how that works. So I think taking things apart was really fun. And then, I think I just liked different mechanical things like bicycles and cars. And I like trying to fix things. Um, and my dad actually, sometimes uh, we would work together on trying to say, fix his truck or his car or something like that. So I think that's what got me interested in engineering. And then when I was able to go uh, to high school and then to university, I got to take some classes where you actually build things. Um, so when I was in high school, I took a, a class about making things out of wood and I really enjoyed that. And so uh, um, somebody told me then you might like engineering. So I decided to go and become an engineer. Why didn't you join MIT d -Lab? That's a good question too. I, so in the beginning, after I finished school, I was working as an engineer um, uh, in, a, in a, actually in a laboratory where I was doing research. And most of the research we were doing was related to um, engineering and energy in Europe and the US. And I think at that time I had a very small piece of a big project, right? So I. I knew it was important. I wanted to contribute to this project, but I couldn't really see how it was having a big impact or benefiting a lot of people because I was just kind of focused on such a narrow, small piece. And so I became interested in working on some of these problems that are, I think are often overlooked. 
like cooking and heating in Africa, for example. And, and um, so I became interested in those because you can, you can see the impact that it could have on people from very early on, right? We get to work together with people and work on those types of technologies. So I really, uh, I thought that impact was really important and it also contributes to sustainable energy and helping to reduce climate change, which are also important to me. And so MIT D-Lab is a place actually where they do a lot of work and projects um, related to those types of communities that you know often aren't focused, they aren't the focus of uh, a lot of the companies that we see um, in our lives. And um, they, the work also has a, a big impact on not only people's lives, but on the climate and on the future of the planet. Um, so I think that was the reason that I joined MIT D Lab. To follow up on the alternate, uh, the alternate charcoal, how does this way of making charcoal affect climate change? Yes, that's a good question. So remember when I talked about um, how we make charcoal from wood, what we call traditional charcoal, the old way of making charcoal. <clears throat> so when we make that kind of charcoal, we have to cut down a lot of trees, right? Sometimes you can take small pieces that have fallen off of the tree, but most people that make charcoal will cut down a live, fresh tree, um, a big tree usually, to make charcoal. And an important thing in terms of climate change is forests and trees, because we know when trees grow and actually all plants, living plants grow, they actually take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, and turn that into what, what I call biomass, or that's the, the plant as it grows. And so that's actually a big, mechanism or mode for absorbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the plants and soils. Um, so when we cut down those trees, we reduce the ability of forests to absorb carbon dioxide. And then that actually makes climate change uh, even worse and global warming, um, yeah, greater. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. My final question is, how are you engaging MIT students in your work? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, that's a lot of what I do is, is work with students um, and, and have them help me out on my projects. So a lot of times when we, for university students, we need to study you know, the basic fundamental topics like math, algebra, calculus, um, chemistry, physics, you know, these kind of things, even computer science, right? Um, and usually when we take those ty types of courses as engineering students, we mostly w work on kind of made up problems or make believe problems that aren't real. And I think a lot of students want to learn how to work on real problems. And so at D-Lab, it's nice, actually, we can engage the students and have them work with researchers and professors and other staff in the lab here um, to work on some of these problems. So actually, the place where I am right now, this is a, a, the D-Lab workshop. And maybe Ali, you've been here before, I think, so you recognize it. Yeah. So the workshop is actually a great place to work hands-on, actually making things uh, related to our projects. So actually just recently, I was working with some students on making a cook stove. And so we were cutting pieces of sheet metal and making things out of brick to assemble the cook stove. So it's really exciting to be able to do some hands-on work, learn how to use those simple tools for making things and actually make something and test it out. So the other day we actually went outside, the weather was nice and we tested the cook stove um, out in the parking lot outside of D-Lab. That was fun. Good question. I have one last question. Okay. Uh, are you working on any other projects that can help the environment? If so, what are they? Um, let's see. 
Yeah, that's a good question also. So I mentioned the, Ali asked me about the alternative charcoal made from farm waste. So that's one of them. Uh, another one is cook stoves, which burn the, the fuel, the charcoal mostly, in a more efficient way. So, um, you know, when we cook in our kitchens, we try to actually, you wouldn't just leave the, the, the cook stove on, right, in your kitchen, the oven or the stove on, because it consumes a lot of energy and that, that costs your mom and dad a lot of money, right? So in the same way, people who cook with charcoal and wood, they also want to try to reduce um, the amount of wood and charcoal that they, they use. For people that use wood, sometimes they don't buy it. Sometimes they have to go out and actually pick it from the forest. So they'll pick up pieces of wood or cut small pieces of wood. And while it doesn't cost money, it's free, it takes a lot of their time. So that's important because they, then they don't have time to do other things, maybe work or take their children or do some things at home. And so while maybe it doesn't have a direct effect on sustainable energy and climate change, it's important that we do things that make people's lives more convenient so they can maybe do other things that they enjoy or um, you know other productive activities like work at a job or go to school uh, is another thing and then they might be able to do things that benefit the climate and the planet uh, eventually so I think that's another thing um, so mainly at yeah, charcoal and cooking do you have any more questions no. Okay. Thank you, Dan and Rachel, for the great discussion and for all the things we learned today. Thank you, Ubooters, for listening to this interview. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear about upcoming sessions with other change makers. Please also tell your friends about Uboot and share our social media links with them. And last but not least, go to uroot.co to learn about opportunities to collect digital badges and help us draw down carbon. Thank you.